Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Hope you've enjoyed this week and uh, the weather. Uh, having some cooler mornings and cooler evenings. It's not a thing we can do about the weather, is it? But there's one thing that we can't do about that doesn't frustrate us like the weather does. And that is that God loves us just like we are. And it's not a thing we can do about it. Isn't that great? Amen. Uh, one of the main, uh, it's only one announcement that we have, unless you have some. Anyone else have an announcement? Okay, the one announcement is uh, having a called business meeting next Sunday <clears throat> to elect five new trustees. Let me try to explain best I can why we're doing this. We've had directors, not trustees, and Jerry and, and uh, Sylvia was our last uh, trustees and they rotated off. But in June of 1980, for some reason, the church deeded the property over to the trustees for some reason. And then in 1990, when the church was incorporated, those attorneys failed to see that, uh, that the church had been deeded to the trustees and they went ahead and incorporated. Now that we're going to be reincorporated with Hope Church as Hope Church Conoke, they said it's. Uh, they said that has created a problem, and what they have, uh, what the uh, attorneys say that we need to do is to elect five more trustees, calling them trustees because they were tr trustees back in 1980, and there were five of them that we needed to vote on five trustees. Their main purpose will be, after the vote, they are trustees, and then Susan Medley will write up the minutes of the meeting, will send it to Cano, Cano will send it to the attorneys, they will incorporate that information into the document that needs to be signed for us to become incorporated. They send the papers to Hope Church, Hope Church comes and meets with the trustees, and they sign it, and we will be incorporated. So it's, uh, they said it would be a, a, a legal matter that we needed to do that. So that's what we're going to do next Sunday as we have a called business meeting to elect those five trustees. Any questions? Any questions about it? Yeah, Hank? Do you have five that's willing to serve? We have four that's willing to serve. Uh, and that's the four that ser had served as a pastor search committee, now the transition committee, uh, because they have been more, uh, have known more of the information during this time of what we're trying to do to, uh, to meet with uh, Con Oak and be adopted by them. And if they. Huh? Do you need five or four all the need? We need four, and then someone else uh, can, we have in mind someone to ask, but if, uh, uh, if y'all want to do it that way, or either you can, from the floor, uh, recommend five people to be trustees. It's whatever you want to do at that time. But we do have four that are willing to serve, the four that was on the transition committee, which is uh, Mike and Kenneth and Sylvia and Susan. And if one of the other trustees, uh, directors who have, uh, not, have not been on there, uh, they can serve, or you can choose to elect five from the floor to be voted on. So when, tell me what you want to do next Sunday. Yes, Richard. Now, is that a long-term duty, or is it something you, you do this, once it transfers, then you're pretty much done? That's right. Once the trustees sign the document for our incorporation, the trustees will be no more, meaning they won't have a job anymore, because then we'll be, not that they'll not be anymore, but uh, we'll be incorporated then, and then 
we will have a board of uh, directors over uh, the church to be the trustees and uh, directors. I'm sorry. Then there will be f five directors. Uh, I don't know how many directors will be on it, but they will take them from Con Oak and they will take them from Hope Church. We will not have trustees. We'll have directors. Sort of messed that up, do you but do you understand? Yeah, it's just part of the process you got to go through. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. May we get down to something that hopefully is not quite as confusing, but will certainly be more uplifting than legal matters, and that is to worship our Lord. May we bow. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are here today in your house. Help us to relax in your spirit. We have a lot on our hearts and on our minds, but help that to be set aside so that we can focus on worshiping you, loving you, lifting your son's name, lifting him up, that we may all be drawn closer to him. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. And now Mary will come and lead us in our first hymn. I will try not to be quite as confusing, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> We're going to sing page 56, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, if you'll stand and sing the first and third verses, please. <clears throat> suggest anything you want and if I know it we'll sing it. <laughs> Thank you Mary. For a pastoral update, uh, Dave had a doctor's appointment this uh, week, went real well and uh, so he's doing much much better and hopes to get rid of his oxygen soon. Remember Kathy Shutt, who has some dental work uh, to be done, and Mary Nell. I called her, but she wasn't at home, so she must be doing better. She's, she's doing, getting better every day. Better every day? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, Shirley Myers and Ken, Kenny are not here today. Shirley is not uh, feeling well, so uh, please remember Shirley. Continue to remember my mom, June Hester. We'll know by Friday if she's going to stay in the uh, the nurses care the instead of going to the nursing home uh, chances are she will go to the nursing home because she's eating better and enjoys the food a little bit better and uh, but she's not wanting to exercise and do her th therapy she she was far behind when she got to the uh, the skilled nursing area out of the hospital, but uh, she's just not doing real well. So please pray for her. Pray for us as we help her to make this transition to a nursing home. It's been a uh, <clears throat> ordeal trying to get Medicaid and go through that process, which is awful, as you have done that with some of your parents or loved ones, uh, maybe. And... Uh, even the people that I talk to at the social services says, you know, things 
uh, we got a lot of problems here. <laughs> and everybody said, well, really? And uh, they said, you know, it's hard. Some people we're here trying to help and trying to trying to help people and other people are just out for money. So there are some good people everywhere uh, that are trying to do things and help, but our government makes it very hard <laughs> to enjoy what they do sometimes. So uh, please pray for them and pray for my mom that uh, we'll find out something this week and things will go well. She'll, she'll be able to get Medicaid and, and be able to go. St uh, and they've already offered us a Medicaid bed there at the facility at Brookridge, which is a miracle in itself because she may have to go to another city somewhere if, if they had not done that. So I thank the Lord for that. Any other, uh, in, anyone else that we need to add to our prayer list you might know? Jerry? Give us an update on your daughter, Rachel. We had her since she had an automobile accident and lost her job. How's Rachel? Well, thank you. She, uh, she did lo lose her job, but she lost her car also. And, uh, but she's got another job now and doing well. She worked, even worked on Saturday. And so she's uh, happy to, thankful to have a job. So she's doing well. She's uh, 15 months clean now without alcohol or drugs. And so she's doing well. So pray for her. Thanks for asking. Anyone else got someone to pray for? Okay, may we bow. Most gracious Heavenly Father, our hearts go out to people who are suffering and struggling, whether they be in our family or whether they be our neighbors or whoever. When we see people that are hurting and struggling, may we pray for them. When we hear the sound of an ambulance, a rescue team going down the road to help somebody, may we pray for them, God. There's so many people that are have dedicated their life, whether it's firemen or policemen or whoever, uh, not, not counting the, the ministers and the Christian workers in our churches that are dedicated to being Christ-like and to giving a cold cup of water and helping people when they have needs. We thank you for that. We thank you that you have touched so many people's lives and encouraged them to be a part of other people's lives and helping them and serving them. We thank you, dear God, for our church family. Though we be small now, we have a desire and excitement about us growing and new people coming and being able to hear the baptismal water stirred once again, Father. We just thank you, dear God, that you got a plan for us. Even though sometimes we can't see it, we don't know what it's going to be, we get tired of waiting, but you say that you're going to bless us that you're going to use us for your glory. So just help us to be available. Help us to continue to pray for our country, our leadership, and pray for those in charge even in our local government, that they will make wise decisions that will be unselfish and that will help others. We pray for those in our own church flock here that are suffering, Dave and Kathy Shoot and Mary Nell and June Hester and Shirley Myers and others that we don't know of. We pray that you'll bless, you'll heal, you'll guide, you'll strengthen us, dear God, for we need it. We need it day by day. We can't function without you. And sometimes we say, how do the, the wicked, how do the non-Christians make it without you? We are so thankful and humbled that you brought somebody into our life to tell us about Jesus whether it's a minister, a Sunday school teacher, a neighbor, a parent, or whoever. We thank you for it. We thank you for loving us and blessing us. Now draw us close together and close to you as we sing your praises, as we pray, as we preach your word. May your will be done. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Okay, thank you for praying along with me. And turn in your Bibles, if you will, to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, the ninth chapter, reading just short five verses. This is such a, this whole story, this whole miracle fills up all 41 verses of chapter 9. And of course, I'm not going to try to preach on the whole story. I'm going to preach on just part of it and hopefully uh, do a couple more messages in the story in chapter 9.
But let us read this morning chapters 9, verses 1 through 5 as I preach on what do they see when they visit our church. John 9. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work for the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. May God add his blessings to the reading, to the doing of his word. I don't know about y'all, but I frequently say things, and then 10 minutes later I said, I wish I should have said. So what I should have said a while ago is, if Darlene knows it, then we can sing it. See, she agrees with me. So. But I know she knows this one. I hope y'all do too. Page 547. I stand amazed in the presence. If you'll stand and sing, and if you don't know it, if by the first verse, do it. sing the second verse like you did last time. Because, see, I can hear y'all. Years ago, I spoke and played, and sang, at a camp for the blind sponsored by the Lions Club. The Lions Club International, or the, as it's called, or something like that, is about 104 years old now, with 104 million lions, they call them, across America with a mission. Not only to help the blind, but to relieve the suffering of countless people with human, humanitarian efforts. At the Lions Club for the Blind, I met this African-American young man that sang and played the piano, and wow, was he good. He could really sing and play. And after we got, I got through singing, speaking, and after he played, we got together and had a little jam session. Well, people got around the piano, and they sang with us, and people were dancing, and oh, we had a ball. It was just a great time. And I still remember it fondly. And I was so impressed with their talent, their positive attitude, and the joy that they had in their hearts, and the joy that they shared with everybody and shared with me. I was so impressed that I wrote an article for a newspaper called What the Blind Helped Me to See. Today I want us to think about a man born blind here in the Gospel of John, the ninth chapter. And this man was thrown out of the church, out of the synagogue, because he was healed of his blindness by Jesus on the Sabbath. Let me read it to you in verse 32 through 38. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. This is the 
the religious leaders in the synagogue speaking to this young man who is now who now can see, but they have interrogated him about who it was that that healed him. Who was he? What was his name? How did he do it? What did he say? On and on and on. But in verse 33, if this man were not from God, he could he, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, You were completely born in sins, and are you teaching us? They got real offended for him telling them about this man that had healed him. And they cast him out, threw him out of the church. Jesus heard that they had cast him out in verse 35. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Threw him out of the church. They threw him out of the church, and Jesus goes and finds him and saves him. Jesus picks up and keeps what the world throws away. I want us to think about these things today. What do people see when they visit Cano Baptist Church? And how do we view them when they visit us? How do we see? How do we see them? Do we see them only as sinners, broken, with no future? Or how should we view them? How should our new pastor view them? How should I view them? How should we view and treat especially non-believers who are broken and suffering and struggling and those who are desperately seeking spiritual answers and guidance for their lives? Jesus thought it was important the way that we view people. A good question. Do visitors see us welcoming or ignoring people when they come to our church? Do we greet them warmly with a smile and invite them to sit down beside us? Do we go the extra mile and make them feel at home? And especially after they join. Many churches, they just, they call it dipping them and dropping them. After they get baptized, we forget about them. But how do we assimilate them into our church family and make them feel like they belong, like they are part of the family? Look in verse 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. As Jesus passed by, he saw this man. He actually saw the man. No one told him that there's a man down the road who is blind. We think you ought to go see him. He didn't go looking for this man. But he saw the man. He saw his disability as he passed by. Jesus sees the suffering, the disabled, the broken, the sinful people. He looks for them. But we don't always see them, who they are, but only the condition that they're in. In verse 2 it says, And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The disciples didn't even see the man. They asked a question about his condition. About more, uh, more than that, they asked about his spiritual condition. And they ignored him as a person. You know, we ignore the things that are unpleasant and that make us feel uncomfortable. When we stop at a stoplight, there's a woman or a man sitting down or standing up or... <laughs> I hate it when those people stand in the middle of the highway and it's 97 degrees and they have a little dog there with an umbrella around him. And I told one of them, I says, this is, you, this is too hot a weather for your dog to be out here. He says, oh, that's why I got him the umbrella. It's hard to see those people. They make us uncomfortable or angry. It's hard to see homeless people or winos in, on the street. Or people begging for money when we get out of the car at Walmart. Those with disabilities. 
and those with deformities. Don't they make us uncomfortable sometimes because we don't know what to say to them, we don't know how to associate with them, and we don't need know them. So we sometimes just sort of turn the other way and ignore them. But Jesus always sees these people. The disciples talked over the man. They didn't even speak to him. They didn't even say anything about him being blind. So what Jesus, how Jesus reacted to him just went over their head. And Jesus may have spoken to him. He may have even touched him. We don't know. But they asked a judgmental question about the man, a foolish question that we still ask today. It's an inaccurate theological question. And they ask it in verse 2. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Who sinned? Well, we are responsible for our own sins. This young man could not have sinned before he was born. And they asked, was he blind because of his sins? Of course not. And we, he was not responsible for his parents' sins. We're responsible for each of our own sins. And the belief is common today that God blesses the good and He punishes the wicked or He punishes the bad people or those without Christ. But every time we suffer and we have crisis, it doesn't mean that we as Christians have committed some horrible sin. Even in the life of of Job, we found this going on in his life. Through his disaster and his suffering, some of his so-called friends even said to him in Job, Job 4, 7, and 8, was saying that it was his fault that, he had, that this catastrophe and this suffering and crisis was in his life. Job 4, 7, and 8. Remember now, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the upright ever cut off? Even as I have seen those who plow iniquity and so trouble reap the same. By the blast of God there they perish. And by the breath of his anger they are consumed. It was all Job's fault, they say. But we hear Jesus say in the New Testament that it rains on the just and the unjust. Everybody sins. Everybody endures suffering. Everybody goes through crisis. God help us to see people as Jesus does. As I mentioned a while ago, I have been at the social services office talking to people, signing papers, gathering information, and it's been a real headache, but something that just has to be done because our mother is applying for Medicaid so she can be taken care of if she gets into a nursing home. As I sat there in the social service lobby of Forsyth County, there is a parade of all types of people coming by with misfortunes. They had been shuffled around by life, you could tell. And I thought to myself, what crisis, I wonder, have they been in? They look poor unkept and lost. Some of the young women even looked like girls and they had a baby on each hip and carrying another one right here. And I wondered about them. It's easy for us to criticize and judge as I was doing that day. Who are these lonely, desperate, out of work, struggling people I wonder if they are a Christian. I wonder if they go to church. I wonder if they have a job or probably can't keep a job. They're probably too lazy. That's why they don't have a job. Have y'all ever had those thoughts about people? That could have been true. But I don't know it was true. I don't know the facts about them. I was just making an assumption. But as a Christian, as I looked at them, I should not, it should not have mattered what condition there was or why they were there. They needed help, and that was the point. I had been already studying this text this week, 
And I was reminded of the disciples who were asking the wrong question about the blind man. It wasn't about his sin or his parents' sins. It was about his condition. They were asking the wrong question like I was asking the wrong question. And as I sat there and criticized these people and looked at them, God spoke to me and said, the wrong question. The wrong question. A better question would be, how are you going to minister to them? How would you minister to them? How would you help them if they lived in your community? If they were in your church? If they were in, if they were your neighbor? That's a better question that I should have been asking. In the Life Application Bible Commentary, it says that we all live in a fallen world. Good behavior is not always rewarded and bad behavior is not always punished. But regardless of our situation, Jesus has the power. Regardless of all these people's situation that I saw as social services, God has the power to heal them. God has the power to help them, to encourage them and bring people into their lives that will be a blessing to them and strengthen them and to help them to move on with their life. That is what people are looking for when they come to church. When the visitors will come to our church, they will be asking, I wonder if this church has any hope for me. I wonder if they will love me. I wonder if they will accept me and embrace me or ignore me like the rest of the world does. We want to know the cause of everything that happens. We want to know the reason for every disease, sickness, disaster, misfortune, and disappointment in our life. We want to know why. We want to know how. We want to know all about it. But God doesn't give us all those answers. The disciples wanted to know the cause. Who sinned? He or his parents. But Jesus offered them not a cause, but a purpose. The purpose Jesus gave them is in verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. That the works of God shall be manifested in and through him that the world can see. It's a hard response to hear and to understand. Does that mean that every sickness, every disaster is God's will? I can't completely understand it. And when does God allow us to suffer for His purpose? Or when are we responsible for our own suffering? That whatever came into our life, it was because of something that we did, not someone else. This is what I believe. It may not be exactly right, but I'm still working on some of the things in the Bible. Some of the things that we believe, I'm still working to get a fresh and new and deeper meaning of things in the Bible. And I'm sure that you are too. I believe that God uses everything, every blessing, every su suffering that we have. For God allows things to happen so that we can be a witness to God's strength, to His healing, to His courage, his patience, His hope, and His glory, and that we might be a witness, a better witness, a witness of obedience, a witness of trust, that people will see us trusting in Almighty God, and that will be a good witness to them. People will visit our church looking for answers. Many answers, many questions that we cannot answer. What will we tell them? When you people visit our church, Hope Church Cano, and they join the church and they get to know you and you befriend them and you talk more intimate with each other about each other and, how, and learning about each other. And they ask you personally, why do you think that this happened to me? Why do you think this happened, this disability, this disease, the death of my loved one, why did God allow that? They will want to know a cause and we must give them a reason. They want answers. We must tell them about our own experience. Here is a response that you can share with them. 
if you agree with it. If you don't, you'll have to come up with your own. Bishop G.E. Patterson, he's with the Lord now, but he was the pastor of the largest church of God in Christ, a Pentecostal church of 6,000 members in Memphis, Tennessee. And he says, Jesus was saying, the only reason that this man was born blind was so I could heal him. The only reason this man was born blind was so I could heal them is what he was saying to the disciples. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed, should be manifested in him. We're surprised that sometimes things that happen have no other purpose other than the end result be the, that God will be glorified. That's hard to understand and accept. But it's the truth. It is true we suffer because we are sinners. Go back to Genesis, the third chapter, when God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden, cast them out of the garden because of their sin and disobedience. They brought suffering on themselves. Some of our suffering is directly related to our foolish and willful disobedience to God in God's Word and because we break the laws of the land. If a thief, if he robs a bank and he shoots a guard in the process and someone shoots him in the leg and cripples him, he goes to prison and he'll have to suffer as a cripple and as a thief probably for a long time or the rest of his life if he kills someone in the process. A teenager who drives crazy wrecks the car and he kills the passenger with him or he runs over someone or he breaks his own leg or back, he will be suffering or she will be suffering the rest of their lives, their responsibility in the way that they drove. The alcoholic who is suffering a cirrhosis of the liver is dying as an alcoholic because he drank the booze. The daughter that comes to her mama privately and says, Mom, I'm pregnant. She's too young to be a mom. She's too immature. She doesn't have the finances. She doesn't have the wherewithal to be a mother. And she will suffer because of that. She brought it on herself. But everything that happens to us in our life is not a result of our sin. Not everything that happens to us is because we sin. We do make some mistakes and some sins that bring us suffering, but not everything. Bishop Patterson says again, sometimes God allows things to happen for no other reason so that He can set it right. He allows us to get into trouble, to get into a mess, so He can get us out of trouble. So He can get us out of that mess. God will be glorified in the purpose of delivering us from our troubles. Our prayer will be strengthened. Our prayer life will be strengthened. We'll learn to grow and trust Him better. And then the next time we're tempted, we can flee from that temptation. And the suffering will allow us to testify about Jesus and what He has done. Patterson goes on to say he allows us to get in the darkness so that he can turn on the light. Look in verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So one thing we can say to people as they ask us questions is to say God has a purpose for all of us and all of us suffer. We cannot explain everything that happens, but we can enjoy knowing that God has a purpose that will be revealed to us at some time. Maybe it will have to be when we get to heaven. And He is using us for His glory and for our good. Jesus reveals His own purpose to us in verse 4. He says, I must, or continuing with His purpose, he says, I must work for the works of Him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. Jesus tells His disciples in verse 4, I must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day. Jesus knew that His time was running out. It wouldn't be long till He would go to Calvary, give His life for us, die, be buried, resurrected, 
and go back to glory. It wouldn't be long, but he also knew that the church should be urgent today. We have an urgent business of winning people to Jesus Christ and getting out the gospel to people. That's our, that's our goal. That's our mission. That's why we exist as God's people, to worship Him and to glorify Him by going out and touching people's life for Christ's sake. The, more, the man born blind was in physical and spiritual darkness. He didn't know Christ could help him. Darkness is a metaphor for being lost, unable to see Jesus and to experience His salvation. The man listened and he believed what Jesus was saying. When he obeyed, the light came on for him physically and spiritually. The man didn't even know who Jesus was, but he knew this man was different. Look in verse 17. They say, they say to the blind man, the religious leaders, again, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. <laughs> He's different. He's different. He is from God. He is a prophet. And of course, that angers the church leaders. And he obeyed him. And the light come on. When he obeyed Jesus and did what Jesus said, Jesus took the spittle, rubbed it in the dirt, made a mud patty, put it on the man's eyes and said, Now go to the pool of Siloam and wash it off. And the man did that. He believed what Jesus said. This man they didn't even know him, didn't know his name, but he obeyed him. And when we obey Jesus, when faith and belief are together and we do what Jesus tells us to do, the light will come on for us. You remember the old telephone booths. Some of our teenagers don't even know what a telephone booth is. They may know what a payphone is. They're still some pay phones around. New York just now cut out all their pay phones. But the story of a man who was fumbling in the old telephone booth, the glass telephone booth, plexiglass, it has a little seat on it and it had a cord with a phone book hung to it and then there was a box with a telephone that had the place for nickel stamps and quarters for you to put in to make your call. The story goes that a man went into the telephone booth to make a call, but the door was open and he was fumbling around with the phone book trying to find his number to make his call. And someone stepped up to the phone booth and said to him, if you close the door, the light comes on. He closed the door, the light come on, he made his call. Because he listened to someone who gave him some advice and, and directions. The man born blind, obey Jesus. And Jesus tells us, if we will go to our closets and pray, it doesn't necessarily mean we go to a little closet and kneel down and pray, but we get along with God. Just you and Him, you get along with God and you shut out everything else in your life. And you talk to God and you listen to Him the light will come on. Spiritually, He will speak to us and give us comfort, give us direction, give us wisdom, give us insight so that we will know what to do. This man testified of Jesus. A wonderful testimony of Jesus healing him in verse 25. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, because they said that this man who healed you is a sinner. He is a sinner or not, the, blind, the man that can see him now says. Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. <laughs> did, a, did a song come up in your memory all of a sudden? When people ask us the hard questions, when they visit and they ask the hard questions that we can't answer and they are confused and they're struggling, you can say, I can't answer all of your questions. But one thing I do know, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Blind, but now I see. 
that will be a great testimony to them what has happened to you. May we commit ourselves to speaking the truth to people in love and sharing with them about our experiences of going from darkness, spiritual darkness to spiritual light and now having faith and hope of eternity. If you'd like to be more committed, if you've never been committed to our Lord and the light has never come on for you and you don't know Him as your personal Lord and Savior, today the light can come on and you can walk in spiritual light as you accept Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. If there's other reasons, other uh, things that God has laid on your heart today that He wants you to do, that you know that He's been talking to you about, won't you come and commit yourself to Him and say yes? Won't you come to Him and obey Him as the blind man did? And may we walk in His light and thank God for the light He gives us. As God speaks to you, you be obedient and you come. May we stand together.